Yes, hello Eric, welcome, welcome uh, virtually to Bologna Business School. Welcome back in a way in Bologna and thank you for uh, accepting uh, our invitation and taking the time uh, to stay with us uh, tonight. That is uh, the closing uh, talk of our quarant talks. So we had 40, quarant means uh, 40 as uh, quarantine, and we had 40 talks uh, in a row. Uh, since um, we closed uh, the school, uh, and uh, by coincidence, uh, today is the day that uh, Italy slowly reopened uh, the activities. So it's an uh, unbelievable uh, coincidence. So thank you for uh, accepting to stay with us. Yeah, and I wanted to say uh, I was delighted to be invited. Um, I look forward to vacationing in Italy this summer, but I'm not sure that the Italians will let the Americans in. But if I can get there, I'll be there. Well, if there are the conditions for you to be uh, in Italy, uh, we hope uh, you can uh, visit us in Bologna. Yeah. Um, if not, uh, as soon as uh, will be possible, uh, uh, we will be very happy to host you. Um, obviously, and, and, it is and you very... know, you know that I was, I as a boy, I grew up in Bologna. I know that uh, your father was uh, a professor at Johns Hopkins uh, University right. at the Bologna Center, and you yes. spent here, I guess, uh, two years, if I'm not wrong. That's right. And uh, so my address, so everyone knows, it was Tredici Cino da Pistoia, and I went to a uh, Montessori school in oh, really? third and fourth grade, um, where, and I didn't speak Italian but they put me next to an Italian boy that spoke English. And within a month, I spoke pretty good boy English, uh, Italian. And we have pictures of me playing uh, football with my fellow little boys in the, in the yard. Um, so I have a great feeling of Bologna, the arches, uh, the, uh, leaning t the two leaning towers. Uh, and my mother and I would walk from our house to the downtown and back, which is unchanged. The difference now is that it's a, a pedestrian area. When we were there, it was cars. I know that in, in, in an interview, you said uh, that it was a time when people didn't travel the way they do today. Right. And so it was quite exotic to grow up in Italy. And you said that Think that uh, really changed me. How yeah, can it change you? Well, I'll give you an example. In, in the first thing I did was build a big European business because I understood Europe better than other Americans. So, for example, when I joined Google, the first week I discovered Google didn't have any European revenue. Today, Europe is two thirds of the profit of a hundred billion dollar company. So Bologna really changed me in understanding, in understanding the world. And I have a European perspective compared to most Americans because of my boyhood in Italy. Um, so let's just say that I, I love Italians, I love Italy, I love everything about Bologna. So we're looking forward to seeing you in Bologna, if possible, yes. as soon as possible. And, and I will come, now that I've been invited, uh, and when I can come, I will come visit in person your school. Um, Eric, if, if, if possible, I think uh, we both need to lower the volume a little bit, because there is an echo. So okay. I did it, and uh, I think it is better now. Um, so the, the, the second question uh, is a very narrow and technical one. How is the world doing in this moment? <laughs> well, I have uh, been working hard on what we should do in the pandemic. And I am extremely frustrated at the governments that we all have. I think that the governments in general have done a very bad job. And I'm referring to the United States government, the Democrats and the Republicans, and the European governments. 
when you have a pandemic where the disease is doubling every three days, which is what it was in the Lombardy region in Italy in uh, basically late February. Yeah. Right? Even you know the exact, yeah, or, or the first week of March. The only thing that you can do is go to a very, very aggressive shutdown of activity very quickly. And you have to explain to people what they can do and what they cannot do. So in Italy, there was a delay in your government disagreeing on what to do, which cost many lives, cost many Italians. In America, in New York, which is the epicenter of our outbreak, there was a three-week delay between the time they understood the cases would be in New York to the time that they shut down the restaurants. That three weeks, when you're doubling every three days, is a huge number of additional cases. Almost every democratic government got this wrong. And it's really an indictment of their ability to do math. And I'm sorry to be so blunt, but people's lives are at stake. The terrible tragedy of what has happened in Italy and now in the United States, which is largely with older people, could have been less as a result. So now we have a situation where Italy is in much better shape than the United States. Uh, because of the good work of Italians in the last month, your caseload is falling quite dramatically by comparison after a terrible time. And in the United States, that's not true. The caseload is flat and there's plenty of new cases. But in America, uh, people want to go to work without understanding what risks they're taking. There is hope. And one way to think about it is what can you as an individual do? You can wear a mask, you can practice social distancing, and you can wash your hands a lot. So that's what I've been doing. In the next month or so, there will be new uh, rapid testing, which can be done in 20 minutes. So if you have a meeting, you can just test everybody and then you can be sure. That's a big advance. And then soon there will be saliva swabs, which you can go into your mouth and just put it into a little thing. It'll say if you're positive or not. And that will begin to allow a reopening, a real reopening. I don't know, you can, you're a, uh, an expert in Italy. I can tell you in the United States, it's going to be a long time before the US recovers, maybe a year because of this. And that's a terrible tragedy for many people who live uh, economically, they live paycheck to paycheck, they've lost their jobs, especially in retail, in tourism, um, in airlines, um, all of these things. It's very, very sad, very serious. You mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned the delays uh, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, Italy was the first uh, Western country that was actually hit. Yeah. Actually, it doesn't seem that true because uh, just today there is a news uh, about uh, Germany having treated uh, somebody and tracking uh, somebody, tracing somebody um, late January, I guess, or early, early February. Um, there is a debate uh, if uh, we were just uh, unprepared for this. Is, is this one of those uh, unexpected events where uh, you really don't have the routines, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the experience, you don't have the memory uh, of how you could react to such an event. Um, somebody argues that uh, there was a denial of the reality, a kind of unconscious collective denial of what was going on. Somebody else uh, is actually complaining uh, in a very uh, direct way that there were a lot of pressures uh, uh, from the um, many companies not to close. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how do you see? The, the, yeah, I, I have a I have a strong view that the number one function of the government is to keep the citizens safe. It's the most important function of the government. And my view is that the Italian government, there are many, many smart Italians who could have explained the exponential and the growth rate. And the government did, took too long to make a decision. 
That's my criticism. In the United States, there are 50 states. Some of them have extremely intelligent groups of people who are debating exactly how to deal with this problem. And others just seem to be making stuff up. This is something which affects our security and our safety, and it should be done with teams of analytical people. And those teams should include epidemiologists, scientists, technical people, and the decisions should be made based on science, not on gut. We know, for example, today, that the biggest danger are not your family members, which is what people thought they were, but ra rather what are called super spreader places. And a super spreader place is where there's an, a lot of people and they're yelling or there's a lot of their uh, uh, um, breath and droplets uh, that have the virus. We know this to be true. So that's, for, and I don't know about in Italy, but in uh, America, there's a huge outbreak in the meat packing plants where they cut cattle. And there was an analysis yesterday is that the reason is that the people who are in there are working with carcasses and lots of blood and so forth, and they're all very crowded together. It's a perfect place for the virus. So we shouldn't be surprised. Another example is nursing homes, where again, you have uh, elderly people who don't move very much. They're packed in. So had we done a little bit of work and we'd say, these are the likely spots, we could have surgically gone in and really helped and not, not hurt so many people. I mean, I think the shutdown in Italy has been probably too coarse in the sense that there are many Italians that were not at risk who were shut in their homes for 40 days. Um, and that's a real tragedy for, for them. That's, they're not, they're, they're, they weren't going to get sick. They're not in a situation. I'll give you another example. The best place that you can be is on a beach because there's wind, right? And yet here in America, people are saying there's too many people on the beach. I think everybody should be on the beach. <laughs> Partly because it's nice, but more importantly, because you're outdoors. The disease spreads 19 times, one nine times less well outdoors than indoors okay um, during uh, these uh, two months uh, um, the digital transformation uh, accelerated uh, to a rate that we didn't expect um, we might have uh, the chance to see the world uh, of our sons, so to speak. Um, same thing for other changes, not just the, the digital ones. Which do you believe are the most important implications of this acceleration? Are we ready? Um, will the divide grow? Um, which are the challenges and the threats? of uh, such an acceleration, because I, I, see the good, I see the very good points of it, I see the, the values. Um, maybe there are just not values. So, so I want to say that Italians have always been at the leader, leading forefront of communications. Because of my affiliation with Italy, I've been back many times. And I remember riding on the Pendolino 20 years ago and reading an article that every Italian had two phones. It had the high, Italians had the highest number of phones in Europe. So Italians have always been leaders in communications, in style, in understanding how society works and so forth. And I think that's very clear. In this particular case, I think Italian society will become much more virtual. And I'll give you some examples. Instead of going to the doctor, the doctor will be on your phone. I think many social activities, many conferences will be on your phone. And the reason is because the disease is not eliminated. This will go on for a couple of years. They haven't gotten rid of the disease in Europe and there will be a constant fear of reinfection. So an example would be that many of the things that we do in person will become more virtual. Um, I don't exactly know how residential colleges will work but I think you'll, you're going to see limitations in your university, which is the oldest university in the world, I might add, 
um, in, 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 in your university and uh, throughout Europe for these crowded events, like the summer concerts and things like that. Um, so all of those will accelerate this change. Uh, the, in America, the, the most successful companies are the online companies and online distribution. And I think another interesting thing that's going to happen is that the, there was an idea in technology that the sharing companies, this is Uber and Airbnb and so forth, were going to become dominant. But I think people will be much more careful about sharing. There'll be less sharing than was expected. And that's another big change. So much faster 5G, much faster connectivity, much more internet. In Italy, um, the regulators have made, the, the European regulators have made it very difficult for Italians to have, for the Italian telco, Telcom Italia, to get a good rate, rate of return on its uh, capital investment. And this is a complicated problem involving Brussels. I think it's important that there be enough funds to invest in the critical infrastructure of telecommunications in Italy because you're going to rely on it. In many ways, uh, we relied uh, on uh, telecommunications uh, during uh, the last few months. So without uh, telecommunication, we would not have been able to continue the school, to continue yeah. the university, to stay in touch with other people. So uh, this, is really, this is really true. Um, here, I have a question that comes from some colleagues. Uh, one of them is a professor of, uh, Maurizio is a professor of um, innovation management. Um, professor Gabrielli is a professor of artificial intelligence and Professor Colagiani is professor of cyber security. They are part uh, of our team. Um, and this is a question, it is a combination of their questions. So in many countries, research labs and companies are developing applications for contact tracing with the aim of helping the fight against COVID-19. Currently, there is a, a quite hot discussion on these applications, since many persons see as a threat to personal privacy, and most important, many scientists consider those applications completely useless when it comes to real facts about the control of outbreaks of coronavirus disease. Moreover, the concept of privacy has different relevance uh, in different parts of the world. Many aspects related uh, to the COVID crisis uh, challenge several legislation and approaches. Sweden uh, is the most uh, known example. Could not apply and restriction, uh, the restrictions due to the constitutional provisions. Here in Italy and in other countries, there is a lot of debate uh, about using uh, electronic tracing solutions in a voluntary way possibly undermining efficacy. What is your opinion about these applications, which are the risks for the security and privacy? And finally, very um, uh, interesting uh, question, but very, to very abstract level, should we move towards uh, new universal values that need to reconcile international differences on the concept and idea of privacy? So I've spent a great deal of time on the privacy question, especially in Europe, in my, in my Google role. And I think that privacy and security are going to be national, not global. That there will be differences in the laws and the rules. And the example that I would use is the following. Uh, if you look at Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States, all three are very good democracies and all have radically different ideas about privacy and the government. In the UK, there's great trust in the government. In the Germany, there's little trust in the government. And in the US, I can't tell if the government is trusted or not. They're, they're, they're in different places. I think if you look at, at successful strategies for combating the virus, if you look at New Zealand, the prime minister shut down the island, they it's a, it's a small country, it's thir uh, three, four million people, and they managed to get it off of the island by shutting down the island. In South Korea, they put in con very aggressive contact tracing, 
and they've largely eliminated the outbreaks. And what happens is the moment you're reported, not only do they uh, use your credit card and GPS information from your phone, but they tag you as a spreader. We were talking about uh, infrastructures. Anyway. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I think you, you had the best, the best example possible. In general, the internet in Italy needs money. The Telecom Italian needs money. Your government needs to help it get some money and financing to build a stronger internet. Um, and uh, it's worth putting in fiber uh, on the main lines and so forth. Uh, if you go back to the new world is more virtual, you do need to invest in that. There are many savings, right? So we were looking at savings uh, of savings in businesses from travel, savings from um, all those conferences that people don't necessarily are not going to. So businesses are are going to have savings, and of course the the losers will be telecom companies and excuse me, uh, transportation companies and. Um, hotels and that sort of thing, which is terrible. Anyway, I was uh, in, in New Zealand. And so they shut down the country. And in, um, in, in South Korea, they did very aggressive contact tracing. Um, the kind of contact tracing that was done in South Korea was that they would spend their time tracking people's um, whereabouts using their financial information and so forth. It was completely mandatory. And then if you got sick, they would actually follow you and tag you as a spreader. Uh, I can't imagine that will happen in the West. So in the West, uh, the voluntary solutions are good, but they're not going to get enough use without some kind of mandatory use. So I don't think the West is going to do contact tracing um, for those reasons. And about the possibility to reach uh, or reconciliate uh, um, a common uh, value and beliefs uh, about what uh, privacy is, uh, to align it so that we can help the system to better work, uh, in a way. Um, I, I honestly don't know that that's what's going to happen, because if you look in Asia, the Asian governments benefit in their control of their citizens by lack of privacy, it's hard for me to imagine that they would give that up. Um, I'm generally in favor of European privacy laws and so forth, so uh, my bias is with, is with you, but I don't think it will happen globally. Professor Corayani also asks um, the same point about the Apple Google, Google collaboration for implementing uh, the contact tracing app. Um, he says that uh, this is the demonstration that there is uh, no state that can have a real impact without the collaboration of one of the world digital leaders. Uh, something similar occurred when the states uh, asked Google and Facebook to help their elections against the organized campaigns uh, of fake news. And it's a nice example. Um, so he says that uh, he suspects that Google alone uh, or together with competitors, uh, can do even more for helping the digital innovation of societies. But for some reasons, European laws, jealousy, all minded politicians, whatever else, uh, they are not exploiting, exploiting their potential. Is it true? Which reasons would you remove for long-term collaboration, big tech, uh, European societies? Well, uh, first place, Europe, I can say that for big tech in general, Europe is incredibly important. Europe is a large market. The customers are sophisticated and the businesses are mature. So we, have, we collectively have to be in Europe. And there's a constant set of discussions between the European regulators and the U.S. big tech. Um, and you're, you're very familiar with the details. Um, in general, there, is, there are times when um, one of the European countries will pass a law it doesn't make sense to the U.S. I'll give you an example that the French passed the law years ago that would require content to be removed for the whole of Google, not just the French version of Google. So that's where the rub is. But I, I agree with you that in general, the governments and the tech companies together can fight some of these bad things. There's a great deal of activity fighting child pornography. 
there's a great deal of activity fi of uh, fighting misinformation from the Russians. And I'm sure that there will be more. They could, they could do more. I think there's, my guess is that people are a little bit scared of doing too much because the press is very vicious on these things. On the same topic about Maria Carfania, who is a journalist of our uh, National Broadcast TV, um, wonder if you uh, see the future of politics uh, in a new form of governance between uh, states uh, and big techs. Be um, because I, states uh, need uh, yeah. the big techs so much. I, I All the big techs took uh, so much power. Yeah, I've really. heard that argument. I am skeptical because I think governments are different from business. I think there will be always be collaboration because the governments regulate the businesses. But I don't think that there will be a new kind of state um, of that kind. It's much more likely that European countries will start to, well, so let's go back to, we had a very open society in terms of borders and everyone is closing their borders initially because of immigration and then later for uh, because of um, other things. So now you have this extraordinary nationalism, which is quite bad in my view. I'm a person who believes that of, in global integration. So it seems to me that um, it's likely, for example, that Italy will have a relationship with another country that's a very close relationship, that's a trusted relationship. And as a group, I think that, put another way, European integration is on pause for the reasons that we all know. I have another question that was uh, asked uh, in a slightly more direct way that I tried to rephrase. Um, there is a debate about where companies operate, work, and make profits and pay taxes. How, how can we ensure that uh, global businesses working uh, across global markets pay taxes in, uh, in an equitable way to enable the kinds of investments uh, in R&D, education, and public infrastructures needed for the future? So I would rather not speak about Google at all here. Um, I said companies. I, yeah, companies. So let me say that in general, there is a, an initiative in Europe to change the accounting standards to try to more reflect where the revenue is being made. And there are plenty of U.S. companies that, pay, that don't pay as many, much taxes in Europe as they do in the U.S., but there's also plenty of European countries, companies that don't very, pay many taxes in the U.S. for the same reason. This is a global coordination problem, and it needs to be responded to globally. My view on taxes is that they're not optional, and you'll have to pay them. Um, and especially now, uh, I think taxes are going to have to go up because revenues are down. So in Europe, economic activity is down. The European nations will need more taxes. In the United States, uh, and especially in the states, not the federal system, they need more money. Right? It's a, the shutdown is extremely expensive for these, uh, for these countries. It doesn't, uh, it, it's not just a problem of uh, European uh, companies in the US or US companies in uh, Europe. It's just, for example, a matter of Italian companies that maybe they do not have their own headquarters uh, in Italy. So it's a more. Yeah. But, but my question was the general problem. What I, learned, what I learned in this tax stuff is that. There's always focus on the company and the country that's not paying the right amount of taxes, but you have to solve the problem on a global basis, right? Because for every, every country that you're not paying enough taxes in, you're paying more taxes in another country, and they don't complain. So uh, again, there is a, a legal process whose name escapes me at the moment that needs to be accelerated. I mean, and Europe did this to itself. Uh, if you remember the Dublin exception, the Ireland exception, 30 years ago was done to stimulate Irish business. 
And uh, the, I, when I was at Novell, um, and I think certainly when I was at Novell, maybe when I was at Sun, we used that exception 30 years ago. So uh, businesses will react to the sta tax stimulus that's made available to them. Before the pandemic, uh, the, the worst crisis we were facing uh, was the degradation of the planet, with notable differences among the countries uh, in terms of determination and sense of urgency. A wealth of new initiatives sprouted uh, under growing pressure from the public opinion. Uh, the University of Bologna has just been ranked uh, number six in the world uh, for uh, impact uh, in terms of uh, SDGs. Uh, yeah. is the first in Europe uh, and also the largest amongst uh, the first uh, ten. Um, Alpha Greener Solutions uh, are still proposed as ways uh, to jump, uh, start again the economy catching the two burst uh, with one stone. Uh, the truth is still different. Uh, in the US, the Environment Protection Agency has been significantly undermined uh, in role and power. In Europe, automakers uh, are calling for a suspension of the pre-crisis uh, stringent pollution limitation and the corresponding uh, economic burdens. How do you see things uh, evolving? Will we use the crisis as an opportunity to accelerate uh, or to slow down the transition to more sustainable society? Do you feel that the big tech, uh, with their huge power, both on the economic and technological level, have a moral obligation to actively contribute uh, to the mitigation of a planetary problem such climate change? In this case, uh, what should they do? So, with respect to big tech, all of the big tech companies have worked hard to try to address sustainability. The core problem here is CO2 going into the atmosphere. And we've now done an experiment for two months where we can see that the nitrous oxide has come down and you can see how quickly, how quickly nature recovers. So you, if there was any doubt as to what humans were doing to the planet, it should be clear that if we stop it, you immediately get a stronger planet. So there's no there's question. There's no question. Yeah, there's no question. It's not a debate. There is, there is a good news in a way. Yeah. So that's, in that sense, it's good. I am primarily concerned about um, uh, sea, sea level rise. Uh, hang, hang on a sec. Hey, guys, I'm on a conference call. Um, sorry, guys. Um, the, uh, the, so um, let's, let's go back to this. So if the West Antarctic ice sheet melts, the global, more, uh, the global sea levels will rise between 7 and 21 feet, so 2 to roughly 6, 7 meters. And most models indicate that that will occur within a few hundred years. So not in 10 years, but maybe a few hundred. And that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. And I, I, worry, I worry that we don't understand that that's irreversible, that it's unlikely to come back anytime soon. Um, there, there are plenty of things to worry about, but sea level rise um, is not, remember, it's not the height, it's the mileage in. Many parts of our world are very, very low deltas. And so when the sea level rise rises, the salt water goes miles and miles in and inundates all the fresh water and where everybody lives and so forth and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a great concern that I have. Do you think that this crisis uh, will help to have a more responsible approach, uh, practically? Or do you think that because of the economic crisis, uh, I mean, uh, behind the economic crisis, there will be, the, there will be interests to uh, give up uh, with uh, regulation, uh, maybe suspend uh, norms uh, and uh, get worse? So in, in Europe, the Europeans will continue to do the right thing. In the United States, the current administration is promoting fossil fuels and doing the wrong thing. Many of the Asian countries will do the wrong thing for economic growth. The biggest one to worry about is India. 
because India uh, in the last few years has had 15 of the 20 most polluted cities. India is continuing to build um, uh, coal-fired power plants, even today, which is insane, given the carbon loading of coal. And uh, that's a real tragedy. So uh, I think that we'll see more of the same. What's interesting to me is that at the moment, the price of oil is almost zero. And so we know that we know that when economic activity slows, the marginal price of oil goes to very low. And so that will have a huge implications for oil producing states for the reasons that you can imagine. So the, the stability of the Middle East, think about Iran and Iraq, whose primary revenue source is oil. Until recently, that was true of Mexico. I mean, um, uh, Russia is another example. Russia has a terrible outbreak, a great deal of suffering, but they are also very dependent on oil and gas. Um, I think roughly two thirds of their of their country's economy is oil and gas related. You you would know, uh, but these are big changes, big big changes. Talking about uh, geopolitics, uh, um, the competition between the U.S. and China is going, uh, growing, it's going worse. Um, somebody believes that the President Trump concern is that China might uh, take uh, the control uh, of planetary data um, because they are becoming the most impo more important source of power. Do you think that this is a, a real area of competition, um, how do you see this competition and the role of data in this competition? Um, I am one of the people who believes that China is not going to have a war with us soon. I am one of the people who believes that China is a country that has its own history and its own culture and that it wants to showcase how clever and wonderful it is by growing and doing, doing what it considers to be the right things. And it doesn't agree with many of the global systems that were put in place when it was weaker. So my view is that you have to compete with China, not fight them. And that's an important distinction. Fighting means with guns but competing means doing innovation. And I worry that um, China is so well managed from a technology perspective, is growing historically so quickly, that the United States will become less relevant and the uh, Europe will become even less relevant. So in other words, China is a competitor which shows you what you're not doing well. Now, I don't want to be Chinese. I don't want to have the CCP running our countries. But China is a good reminder that we should be investing in the Internet, in biology, in technology, in science, in industries, um, in the great universities. And uh, I would say that Europe has, in generally for, has generally forgotten that. And in the United States, it's being forgotten. Um, so, for example, in the United States, there was a $3 trillion bailout almost none of that money went to universities. And yet those universities are where the new economies are built, they're where the solutions to the COVID crisis are built, where the new modeling is done, all the new drugs and so forth and so on. So I think that, that Europeans collectively and Americans are going to learn that China is a tough competitor and they're very, very smart. I take them very, very seriously. So you take the competition more on the innovation, in the innovation uh, I yeah, so in fact, China issued a report in October on the 70th anniversary of their success as a, as, a, as a CCP. And they said that their primary job was to become global leaders in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, telecommunications, aerospace, very fast trains, and uh, new forms of energy. Well, that's my whole world. Basically, we were, we were uh, leading. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's everything that I work on. So, so they're intelligent, 
And they've identified these as the areas that will provide economic growth and strategic power for their country. What's the Italian list? You don't have one. What's the American list? We don't have one. What's the European list? It doesn't have one. So I think China as a competitor shows us what we should be doing. We should prioritize our areas of innovation and we should focus on that. And we should have our universities be teaching that. We should have great entrepreneurs. We need more, we need people to found Fiat, the new Fiats in, in Italy. We need great companies to be founded by your students. You're in a business school, right? How do, how do we get more new jobs, new companies and so forth in Italy and in the Euro and Europe in the whole and in the United States? Obviously, um, I don't know about the US, uh, I, I am one of those who believe that uh, Italy cannot have a list uh, without a European list uh, and Europe cannot have a list uh, without an Italian list, but this okay. is a long... Uh, well, <laughs> but but, but could, I, could I make a suggestion that Italians are very clever. It should be possible to make a list of what you want in competition with China. I'm trying to get America to have a list in competition with China. I care more about what's on, that there is a list than that what's on the list. Because if there's a list, if, if there's a list, right? So let's say, for example, chemical processing. Well, then that will help guide the, the universities and your government to decide where to do things. The priorities are not right. The, the growth comes from technology and science innovation in the world. Yesterday, there was uh, an article by our chairperson, Professor Romano Prodi, who was also the uh, president of the European Commission and Prime Minister, that was talking about um, the need uh, for uh, a new industrial politic, uh, yeah. or new industrial policies uh, in Italy. And I think that this list uh, is exactly what we need uh, for uh, industrial policies. But... Um, um, I, be, I believe that the, the country in the list uh, here has to do with the European list. Anyway, uh, we will be too weak uh, as the countries alone. That's what I believe. Well, but, but let me give you an example. Um, Germany, 10 years ago, issued something which they called Industry 4.0. And Angela it became Merkel, a kind of trendy... Yeah, it became a buzzword, right? And um, I don't agree with some of what's on Industry 4.0 because, as an example, it didn't have enough about software. And during that time, Tesla came along and made a better product for a while. And the Germans were very upset. But the Germans had a, they had a name for it, right? It had a bias, but it had a name for it. So the, Italians, the Italians should have such a thing and then we can debate making it better. I think it's a good agenda to, to work uh, during your next uh, trip to Italy. That's right, and I would love to do that with you. <laughs> but I'll give you an example. I think, um, I think that the, the COVID crisis has shown us how important the digital world is. So the Italy as a country should figure out how to maximize leadership in digital in the things that you care about. Italy is historically a small manufacturing country. Many, many in Northern Italy, many, many small companies that do uh, vertical, essentially specialized manufacturing. How does technology make them more effective? How do they get a larger market? How do they get better connected? All of these are questions that a strategy would address. Much of the economic growth comes from that. Um, and you could do that independently of, of uh, Brussels. I have a, one more question that comes from Andrea Pezzi, and then I have a final question that comes from me. Uh, and I think then our time is uh, gone, basically. I have thousands of questions coming here, but since I had to switch uh, the device, uh, I, I can't read them all. Um, so, this is the technical thing. January this year, Chrome announced the third-party cookies dismissal. The industry of digital advertising 
is now sharing uh, many product companies uh, such as uh, DMPS, DSP and other, AD Tech that leads their business on third party cooking, so a drop in the company value. If this uh, is a great opportunity for Facebook, Google and Amazon because uh, they are war gardens, what will be the future the, of the others, the ones uh, mentioned above? So, um, I don't know enough about that decision at Google to be able to comment on it very well. No, no, generally. So, so in general, um, the problem with third-party cookies has been that they have been seen as privacy violations. So this is a case, This third-party cookies, again, I'm not speaking about Google, so please don't hear this in context. The, uh, the, the third-party cookie issue has been controversial for decades. And this is a good example where um, it's a real balance of interest. I, I don't think I can say anything more than that. I have the, the, the last question. Uh, my, my concern, uh, I am a behavioral scientist in management, uh, and my main concern during uh, this uh, phase of reopening and the gradual uh, return to normality or new normal um, are not the safety procedures that company has carefully performing. I am more concerned about the automatic behavior of people. Mm -hmm. I live in Bologna downtown and I see from the, from the window, uh, from the balcony, when people uh, meet uh, each other, maybe they didn't see each other for two months. They, they shake hands. They, they, yeah, they, sure. they, um, I was talking with a very important entrepreneur that was a guest here on this uh, series of talks. And he was saying, uh, we, we adopted the, the most, uh, um, the most uh, uh, rigorous uh, system to avoid uh, the people, take them distant, avoid the people interact. But when they have a break, they go to take a coffee together, or they go to smoke together, or whatever. When they meet outside, they, they, they have automatic um, behaviors. So I wonder if there is a, a, a solution for this. And in this case, I would mention Google, but not only Google. Amazon, already media that is very relevant, uh, and the telecommunication systems uh, and the mobile uh, companies, uh, if there shouldn't be a kind of uh, continuous word, uh, warning uh, to keep people uh, aware uh, in any minute of what is going on. So I, th I think that that's a good idea. Um, my experience with continuous warnings is people very quickly don't see them. You so, need to change them. Yeah. So, but again, I think at some point it doesn't work. Um, what I really think is this is a case where Asians have grown up in very dense societies and they developed uh, bowing, right? No handshaking and, and mask wearing in public. And I think that in those two things, Europe and America will become much more like Asia. Uh, I, for example, don't shake anybody's hands. I don't see well, any reason why I have to. And, and people reach out their hands and I say, we're not handshaking anymore. I don't, I don't need to do it. I don't need to show that I don't have a sword in my hand anymore. Um, and similarly, wearing a mask is polite because the mask doesn't protect me. It protects you from me. Sure. So I, the tools you have as a, as a citizen of Italy because again, the government may not do the right thing, is hand washing, social distancing, two meters, um, and then wearing a face mask, and you should do that. There will be other tools, but those are the only tools you have. And, uh, and for, for, the, for, the, for the students that are on here, you all are in great shape, because if you get the disease, you won't get it very badly, but you could easily spread it to your parents and grandparents. So even you don't want to be handshaking and so forth. 
Uh, Europeans love to hug each other, and they're very warm and friendly, and especially Italians and Southern, Southern Europeans. You're just going to have to get over it for a while. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much yeah. for uh, closing with us uh, this uh, Quarant Talks. Uh, Thank you. And, and I wanted to say how much I like what you guys are trying to do. And the fact that you did this, the fact that you invited me is a very big, um, is a very big deal. So thank you all very, very much. And please stay safe. Congratulations for getting to the end of your term and graduating. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and we are looking forward uh, to seeing you in Italy as soon I as will possible. see you soon thank as you. soon as possible